Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Sorcerer's Orphan, a podcast created to dissect and explore the inner workings and inspired accidents that have helped the Flaming Lips write, create, and record some of our most iconic music and songs. I'm Stephen Drozd, and I will be your host and your guide for this half hour of discussion and rememberings. Thank you for joining us. Here we go. This is the song, Enthusiasm for Life Defeats Existential Fear, Part 2. Now you may be wondering, what about Part Number 1? Well, we will get to all that. This song was written in February of 2011. It was recorded initially at my home studio, which is the same thing as writing, meaning I'm recording ideas that may turn into a song, but they may not, and we'll keep working on it, which we did. And we took it up to our producer, Dave Fridman, in his studio in Western New York. This was March of 2011, and it was released just two months later, in June 2011. Like I said earlier, this is part two, so let's begin with part one. Enthusiasm for Life Defeats Existential Fear, part one, is a song that was created for a documentary film by our friend Brad Beasley. Now, Brad Beasley is the same guy who made our great Fearless Freaks documentary movie. Well, he was finishing up his next movie called The Creek Runs Red, and we were writing and recording stuff that he perhaps could use for its soundtrack. This movie is quite sad and somber. And Wayne and I loved, and still do love, making music for an already existing theme. And this was actually used in the movie, The Creek Runs Red. This track is called Death in Pitcher. I wrote and recorded this in my home studio. I want to talk about this one special moment that happened. This little section is what I call the star, the motivating element, the special, cool, original thing. That thing you need to kind of stay focused and inspired, the thing that keeps you excited. That little screeching sound is feedback on an orchestra sample that has been run through distortion and delay and then distortion, and then delay again. So sometimes I'm just messing around, and maybe it doesn't sound like much, but that little moment of distorted orchestra very much excited me. And I felt like Wayne would get excited by it as well. So again, this track is called Death in Pitcher. 
The pitcher in that title is the name of a small town in northern Oklahoma that was devastated by mining industry abuse. It's quite depressing, but Bradley's movies always have an optimistic slant to them, which is where I think this title, Enthusiasm for Life, defeats existential fear. I believe this is where that title came from. But titles and naming songs is a funny thing with the Flaming Lips. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, we would make lots of compilation tapes. Cassette tapes for a bit, and then later on, homemade CDs. The title, The Soft Bulletin, came from a cassette compilation Wayne had put together in 1997. I remember thinking, hey, that's a cool title. And I remember I told him I thought it was a cool title. And as you may know, we went on to give our album from 1999 that title. Enthusiasm for Life Defeats Existential Fear was the name of an instrumental song for Bradley's movie. And it was also the name of another compilation tape that Wayne had made. And I remember thinking just to myself that, again, that's a cool title. And I reminded Wayne of how cool I thought it was. And this part is important. We, Wayne and I, always tell each other that something the other has done is really great. And well, you know, you don't know what's good and what's not good. And that little bit of encouragement gives you some energy and allows you to keep going through the times when you aren't so sure of your creations. We never ever really say to each other, that's not good. So we always say, hey, that's good. Keep working on it. Thumbs up. This is a drone in the key of B major that I at first made as a piece of ambient music that I could fall asleep to. It never really worked. A few months later, I added this shuffly drum track to it. I played and recorded this drum beat myself, and though they do end up sounding great together, they weren't actually recorded together at the beginning. And this scenario happens all the time. You can hear that this original track is slightly slower. So, I'll play drums for 30 minutes or so, free form, trying different things, and then go through it later and see if there's any fun little inspired bits, anything that, that grabs me, and, and there was. I stumbled upon this little section and looped it. It's not an obvious loop, but if you listen close, you'll detect it after a while. It's repeating every 16 bars. This ends up being the underlying rhythm for virtually all of our six hour song, also known as I Found a Star on the Ground. And yes, it is actually a song that lasts for six hours. And so with that drum, the one I was trying to sleep to, and these drums that I had looped, I began to make a song, and its working title was, I Found a Star on the Ground. Now, an interesting sidebar to the song title, I Found a Star on the Ground. My daughter at the time was about three years old, and she had like a little plastic star that was one of her toys. Well, she had lost it. She was looking for it. She found it on the ground, and she said, Dad, I found the star on the ground. And so we said that, I found the star on the ground. And I thought, what a great name 
for us all. So without anything specifically in my mind, and no limitations in my mind, it ended up being a song that went for 27 minutes. But it didn't really feel like 27 minutes. There's something quite relaxing about this pace and intensity, or lack of intensity, that allows it to gently flow along without any what we call listening fatigue. Right, so that's 27 minutes. Now, how did it become six hours? Well, here's what Wayne had to say about it. George and I, George is our computer graphics designer guy, George and I were putting together a title card for the packaging of this elaborate strobo trip release and this packaging is kind of a complicated box that was going to have to be printed and the printing back then was going to take about five or six weeks to get it made and get it back to us and we knew what two of the songs were but we wanted to add a third song to this title card. And out of the blue, George loved this title that he just made up and he put it on the title card. He said, I think the third song is gonna be called the six hour song. And we simply put it on the title card. And I knew that we had the one song called Butterfly which is a song that we redid later for the terror. And we had this other song called Evil Minds. And I knew that we had five or six weeks to get this back. And I thought, Stephen already has this song that's almost a half hour long. We could just simply do 12 or 13 different versions of this half hour song. And that would get us around six hours. And that was my fantasy and my logic that I sort of said, okay, well, let's start to do it. So, we had this working template, this 27 minutes. Wayne would come to my house, my home studio, almost every day. And some days we would get 30 minutes of music done, some days even more. It was exhilarating. 
But other days we would only get a few minutes of music done and it would be exhausting. At times I would panic and scream. We can't do it. It's too much. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? <laughs> but I have to say, when I hear it now, I think, wow, I love it. Truly, this music is insane. And though you can hear much pain in my voice, why? Why are we doing this? Just a month later, we are recording a song that lasts for 24 hours. I repeat, 24 hours. So, we go from making the six hour song, an exhausting, seemingly impossible task, to making a song that lasts for literally 24 hours. So this is recorded in October of 2011 and is released on Halloween, October 31st, just two weeks later. Total insanity. Wayne had somehow, and I put somehow in quotations, Wayne had somehow gotten a handful of actual real human skulls and was embedding a hard drive with this 24-hour song inside the human skulls. So the skull theme sort of made sense to release it on Halloween. But the 24-hour song, also known as Seven Skies H3, as punishing as it was, did yield some amazing, amazing tracks. This one, Can't Let It Go, ends with this repeating melody, and in my opinion, it's one of our greatest, most emotionally charged pieces of music. song were we talking about? And yes, I got going on some connections. Some musical connections, some title connections, and some time frame connections to our song. Enthusiasm for Life Defeats Existential Fear Part 2. You see, this song was done in a year when we, the Flaming Lips, did a crazy amount of music. And I'm drawing attention to all the little things that helped this song become what, in the end, it became. So, after the break, we will come back and do a kind of autopsy of the song and lyrics and the actual track itself. Be right back. Thank you for listening. This is The Sorcerer's Orphan, 
a podcast where I, Stephen Drozd, dissect and discuss some of the Flaming Lips' most iconic music and songs. song. Well, most of it. Most of it is doing this. G, G to D to C. G major to G to D major to C to G. It's really doing all that. And here, there's a bass line, bass note, really just one bass note. It goes like this. goes kind of like the melody. <laughs> the melody goes kind of like this. had to say about the lyrics. So yeah, the lyrics to the original, or whatever the original lyrics were for Enthusiasm for Life Defeats Existential Fear Part 2. I don't quite remember what those were, and I'm positive that they are some kind of um, cosmic affirmation sort of <laughs> bullshit. Um, uh, but the lyrics for the new one are, in, in my mind for sure, they're, they're just a connection, an actual part two to the first Enthusiasm for Life song that we did. So, the lyrics to that very first one... Last night I had a horrible dream But the dogs barking in the morning came and chased them all away so there is that last night I had a horrible dream part of it and that song I feel like it's really just got a really great simple optimism to it which I feel like was probably somehow connected to that story with Bradley and his <laughs> depressing movie but it is it is a very simple likable Kind of, kind of songs. It, it reminds me of something that perhaps Doctor Dog would do, um, and that's a great. Uh, I really love, uh, I really love Doctor Dog, and, and so I think that's a great. Hopefully, to them, that's a that's a nice comparison. So the lyrics for the second version, something like this. evil still but the rest is up to me 
So the first one says horrible dream. I had a horrible dream. And the second one sort of comes in and says, I woke up from a bad dream. So there's, it really is connecting the, the, the dream and then what you kind of, what you make of yourself after that. And the first lyric goes, you know, uh, mentions the dogs barking in the morning. But the dogs barking in the morning came in. So my connection to the second one is that the second one begins with this the dog barking. And that, that's an actual recording of our little dog. Her name was Daisy. So, remember that drum loop from the six hour song? Well, here it is in this song. It was just a loop I had made and didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I would get it out and try it on different tracks that we were doing at the time and just see what happened. The song does bounce along in a very similar way to the six hour song. And there were different lyrics. Here's a mix featuring those lyrics before we change them. But also that this song is a good example of how we just use whatever we can from whatever and whenever. Remember its title? Its title coming from Wayne's compilation tape and then again in Bradley's movie. And this is the actual Pro Tools session. It's got just a few tracks, but you can hear how it all came together in the end. And without that bass note going along, you just wouldn't have very much. <laughs> you go. That is the history of our song, Enthusiasm for Life Defeats Existential Fear, Part 2. We had some discussions, I did some rememberings, <laughs> and I really enjoyed presenting this to you. You, the most important entity in the universe, Flaming Lips fans. I couldn't, I was yeah, there. That's that great. Join us next time. We'll be talking about this song. From 1997, an epic, career defining, bombastic studio creation. The Captain. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, peace and punk rock forever. Yes, sir.